Today we are picking up on the series, God and Man in the Church, the series from the book of Ephesians. Who is God? Who are we? What is the church? I want to kind of reacquaint us with the book a little bit. It was written probably about the year 60 AD. It was written from a prison cell, probably a Roman prison cell. It's written about the same time as the book of Colossians and Philemon. It was sent out most likely at the same time. It carries a lot of the same ideas as the book of Colossians. If you read through the book of Ephesians, read right on through uh, the book of Colossians as well, and you will see a lot of dovetailing ideas, both probably written and sent out at the same period of time. In Ephesians, Paul uses really... Uh, superlative language, we've talked about that, and today's language is the most superlative of all that he's using. And I just kind of want to point out to you some of the phrases that he's used. Uh, chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, uh, here is what uh, Paul said as we bring up uh, chapter 1, 7 through 9. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. The deep, deep love of Jesus. He lavished his grace. It was not stingy. It was not withheld. He lavished his grace upon us in wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose with which he set forth in Christ. He's lavished his love, his grace upon us. There's a mystery that he's unfolding, and Paul talks about it here in the book of Ephesians. Secondly, if we look at chapter 2, verse 7, again, he uses superlative language. Uh, God in the coming ages wants to show that he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. This is superlative language, immeasurable riches in kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. This is, these are, uh, Paul is kind of running out of room to describe what it is that he's talking about. Thirdly, we see in chapter 3, verse 8, again, uh, we see this throughout the book. I'm just pointing out a few. To me, Paul says, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Again, superlative language, unsearchable uh, riches, immeasurable grace, lavish grace. God's uh, posture toward us is lavish, it's open, it's pouring out, it's open-handed, it's open-hearted. It is not withdrawing from us, it is rushing out to meet us if we will rush out to meet him. This next passage that we're going to look at are among the most superlative, probably the most superlative passage in this book, some of the most superlative passages in scripture. And it begins with chapter 3, verse 14 to 21. That's our passage for today. For this reason, Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may be grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Length, breadth, height, and depth. To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, surpasses knowledge, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout generation, all generations forever and ever. Amen. That is superlative speech. That's big 
stuff that he's talking about. And it all has to do with God's posture toward us, God's love toward us, God's grace toward us, God's desire to bless us, God's desire to open the mystery of his will toward us, God's desire to make known uh, his marvelous ways to us, God's desire to be present with us, God's desire to strengthen us, God's desire to do for us more than we can even think about being done for ourselves. His attitude toward us is amazing. Think about your children. Don't you have that desire towards your own children that they would do or be or know your love in a much greater fashion than you're able to express that to them? I remember when my uh, first son was born, it was like, oh my gosh, here he is. One question is, what do I do now? But the other question, not a question, the other thing was, this is remarkable. God, you are amazing. You're amazing what you've done. Isn't that a great thing that the Lord does as he brings life into being? And he actually, in some cases, commits those lives uh, to us. Paul starts out by saying, I bow my knee. He says, For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. That word family there is actually patria. I bow my knee, for this reason, I bow my knee to the Father for whom every family is named. That is that the Father is the prototype of the family. The word patria is from whom, some translations say, from whom every fatherhood is made. What we're being told here is that God is personal. He is a father. He is intricately, intimately knowledgeable with us. He is intricately, intimately um, involved with us and concerned for us and fully aware of, of us. He is not the God of the deists who winds up an amazing universe working by amazing principles. And I will say the universe and its principles Uh, uh, are are amazing. Just the mechanical ways in which the universe works are amazing, and they do reveal God's glory, but in a common grace kind of way that anybody can see. What we're being told in this passage is that God is not a distant God far away. He is God who is near, who is present with us. Jesus says he knows how many hairs are on our head. That number is changing every day for some of us. He knows how many hairs are on our heads. He knows, he knows what our need is before we ask. He is aware of our need. He's fully cognizant of every thought that we think. This is not a distant God. He's not a God who is afar off. He is a God who is near. A God who is near. So he says, for this reason, I bow my knees. What reason? As we've been looking at through these passages, what the great revelation Paul came to was that the gospel was not just for a select few. It was not just for the Jews. It was for all people, Jews and Gentiles. The gospel, God's lavish grace, God's great love was going out not just to a select people, but to all people. In other words, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. God loves everyone. God's love is unlimitable. Now you and I may find it hard to love four or five or six people. Well, God loves the entire world well. So it's a simple truth. You can be sure of this, regardless of race, and that's why I think uh, uh, prejudices are, are, are things that are just contrary to the heart of God. Because Paul is saying in this, in this book, every nation, every kindred, every people, Christ has died for. God has sought. God is seeking. So the truth is, God loves everyone, regardless of their background. The contrary truth, the alternative truth is, Satan hates everyone. Equal opportunity. 
He hates everybody just the same. God loves everyone without reservation. And that's the nature of the battle that we are in. And I think the enemy wants us to look at a different battle. But that is ultimately the nature of the battle that we are in. God loves all equally. Satan hates all equally. So Paul says, he starts, he says, I bow my knee. I bow my knee to the Father. He starts with worship. What he sees moves him to worship the Lord. I bow my knee to the Father. Now I want to mention right now, at the close of this message, and I'm going to try to keep it within, within some bounds, uh, I'm going to invite you to come forward for prayer to meet with, to encounter this God whose love towards you is lavish, whose pouring out of his spirit is without limit, whose heart towards you is rich. I'm going to invite as many of you as want to come forward to come forward in prayer, and I'm going to have as many prayer teams as I can to come forward, and we're going to begin asking that we really would know the deep, deep love of Jesus, not just as a theory, but personally, and many times, That ministry of prayer is a means by which this takes place. And it's what I would like to see happen this morning. Paul starts with worship. I bow before the Father. And I see the Father as the source of this immeasurable riches toward everyone. And when we look at this passage, we understand that the worship of the Father, our Father who art in heaven transforms our lives, and it opens us to Christ's riches. What riches? Well, first of all, when we bow our knees, when we devote our whole life to Christ, and we devote ourselves to Him and we seek Him, when we worship the Father of life, we make a full commitment to Him, it tells us the Father brings us his inner strength. Here's how Paul put it, puts it. According to the riches of his glory, you may be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. The first of the riches is an inner strength. Not an outward show of strength, but something internally, an inner strength. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt bereft of inner strength? Have you ever felt bereft, period? Have you ever felt alone? Have you ever felt that you don't know which direction to go? There seems to be no way forward. Have you ever wondered, what on earth am I going to do with this situation? Where do you go? Who do you turn to? Jane and I often say, I don't know what people who don't have the Lord do. I just don't know what they do. His inner strength is a gift that comes from our Father. Now, you maybe have felt rejected or alone or having no way out. Everyone's experienced that at some point in their life. Has anybody ever experienced that? Okay, we have 12 honest people in this room. My guess is everyone's experienced it. Do you know that Jesus experienced that? When he was in Gethsemane before the Father, he said, Father, deliver me. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as your will, but as mine did. You know, King David had that experience where he was totally at his wit's end. He didn't have any idea which direction to go. He probably experienced that many times, but there's one case in particular where he had led a raiding party out to actually work with the Philistines, the enemies of the Israelites. And while he was gone, a raiding party came and destroyed the city where where his group was encamped. It was called Ziklag. They burned it down. They took away as captives all of the wives, all of the children, all of the goods. They ran off with them. And when they got back, David and his men saw what the situation was, and they wanted to stone David. They were furious with him. David was alone. David was in a case where he did not know what direction to take. But here's what the Bible tells us that he did. 
It tells us in 1 Samuel 30, verse 4, if we start there, it says, David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. All of their relatives had been taken away. But then in verse 6, we see that David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him. That's kind of a bad thing when that happens, you know? Usually when they're talking about stoning you, they don't have good things in mind at that point. All the people were bitter in soul. It was because of some decisions that he has made. They had been left vulnerable to this attack. They were bitter in soul as they would be, each for his sons and his daughters who had been carried away. But, but, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You see, when we bow our knees to the Father, he strengthens us in our inner being. He strengthens us in our inner man. This is not positive thinking. This is not, hey, I've got a good idea here. This is not, I'm gritting my teeth. This is not grit. This is great. He strengthened them in their inner man. David was strengthened in his soul. I want you to know that as you worship the Father, the unsearchable riches of his inner strength, his inner power is with you. You know, I uh, spent four years getting a Master of Divinity at uh, Regent University. Uh, that's kind of about the average. If you, if you really uh, keep at it, you can do it in three. Most people do it in four. Uh, I worked either 4 to 12 in the evening or midnight to 8. And then I'd go to school all day. And it, it, was, it was a slog. And my hope was that the Lord would open a door to what at that time was communist Europe, but eventually post-communist Europe, what became post-communist Europe. Do you know what happened at the end of four years? I knocked on every door. I looked under every rug. I pursued every line of inquiry. And I talked with everybody who might have a lead. And you know what happened? Nothing. And I said, well, you know, it must not be God's timing. And then uh, I put out an um, a, a application to a church in Houston, Texas that was looking for a pastor. They were very interested. And we talked, and they happened to be an EPC church, which I really love, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. We actually attended an EPC church. And then as we proceeded in the discussions, I realized, I don't know why I realized this so late, I realized, you know what? They're going to expect me to do infant baptisms. I don't believe in infant baptism. But this looks like a nice job. But I don't believe in infant baptism. This has been a long haul. But I don't believe in infant <laughs> baptism. Houston, Texas, man. But I don't believe in infant baptism. I started running out of stuff over here, and I started ending up over here, but I don't believe in infant baptism. And somehow I thought I could actually have taken the job without, because in our church, they did a lot of believers baptisms. It was an EPC church also. I thought, oh, well, this is the way everybody does it. This wasn't the way everybody does it. So when I let that go, I said, where am I going to go now? What am I going to do? You know what? I've been at that place pretty seriously about five times in my life. I mean, seriously. What am I going to do now? This has not panned out as I expected it to. It was shortly after that that God blew open a door, blew it open 
But I didn't know that's what was going to happen. But you know what you do in that moment? You depend upon the Father who enables you, who gives you the power to experience the strength of Christ in your inner man. He is your inner strength. No circumstance can give that to you. No situation can give that to you. No job can give that to you. It doesn't come from without. It's inside. It comes from the Father. It's a gift of grace, and it's something that He wants to lavish upon us. Some of you are in that situation. Some of you have been in it for a while. What am I going to do now? I can only tell you this. Look for your inner strength from the only source that you can find it. That is from the Father, the Father of lights, in whom is no darkness nor shadow of turning, and from whom every good and perfect gift comes. Cling to him. Do not forsake him. He will not forsake you. You might come to that place, what do I do now? But he will not forsake you. When we worship the Father, we make a full commitment to that Father. He brings us inner strength. Not positive thinking. Resurrection strength. Some of you experience real deep tragedy in your life. I mean deep tragedy. You probably know better than all of us that God comes with comfort in those hours and in those times. That comes from Christ. Worship of the Father brings us to the indwelling Christ. He doesn't just strengthen us. He actually abides within us. He says that you may be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts. In this passage, in this book, Paul says, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. In other words, Christ has come inside and sealed your heart with His Spirit. You become His property. He becomes identified with you, and you become identified with Him. There are people who come to Christ, and for a time they wonder, has God really accepted me? What God wants you to know, not only has He accepted you, He has come to dwell with you and has sealed you with His Holy Spirit. If you have put your trust in Him, if you have purposed to follow Him, to know Him, He will know you and make Himself resident within. He identifies us. He embraces us. He loves us. Thirdly, if we, we worship that Father from whom every fatherhood, every family is named, we become like what we worship. Paul says that I want you to be rooted and grounded in love. Love is the highest of all the attributes. He says that you may be rooted and grounded in love. Love is not a feeling. Love is not dependent upon circumstances. And love is not dependent upon how you're treated. I think all of us struggle with how we are treated at one time or another, whether as children or as adults, as students, as teachers, whoever we might be as bosses, as employees. We struggle as members of a family or members of a church, whatever it might be. We sometimes struggle with how we are treated by others. I got news for you. You have no control, for the most part, over how others treat you. I will say if you punch someone in the nose, they're likely to punch you back. But in general, you have little control over how others deal with you or treat you. But you do have control over your response. You have control how you will approach the situation, whether it's your spouse or friend or co-worker, whatever it might be. Jesus was deeply mistreated. 
And if he was looking for affirmation from his accusers or his persecutors, he would never find it. He was looking for affirmation from one place, the Father. Father, forgive them, for they knew not what they do. Father, if there's any way this cup from pass can pass from me, but not my will, yours be done. I do what always pleases the Father. The Father is fathomless, boundless love. That's hard to live up to. No, it's impossible except for by the grace of the indwelling Christ that we would have the ability to extend that kind of faithfulness to others. Now, Paul says that we are to be rooted and grounded in the love of God, rooted and grounded. St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in him. Every earthly father, every parent, every spouse, every church, every pastor, every child, every coworker is flawed. They cannot love you perfectly. They will love you very imperfectly. God is a perfect father. His love is perfect. It is without flaw. It is without reservation. It is intense. It is personal. And it is eternal. That you may know the love of Christ, the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth. To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. That is God's desire for you. It is also rooted in community. See, this is the other side of the coin. That you may with all the saints, Paul says, comprehend the length, the depth, the height, and the breadth. You know, I don't mind this part you're talking about me loving God, Steve. I can deal with that. I get that. I can love God. I can love the Father. It's just all these people. <laughs> Do you ever feel that way? It's rooted in community. You see, God wants you to walk that love out here. Sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes it requires things that are unpleasant or difficult or that you're unaccustomed to. Jesus showed the way by obeying the Father at all costs, humbling himself, taking the form of a servant, humbling himself even unto death on a cross. And for that reason, God highly exalted him. It is to every generation, it's a permanent love. Paul writes it this way. To him is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Jesus' plan is not for this week or next week or next month or six months or a five-year plan. I mean, all that's good. I hope you're planning five, six, eight, ten months, five, six, eight, ten years. Jesus' plan is a little bigger. His view is a little bigger. And when your two-year plan or five-year plan doesn't go the way you expect, he's not panicked about it. And when, 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 when the vessel he is molding and shaping is marred, he just starts again. Not that, not that he, is, he, is, he is a clumsy potter, but... It's an expression of his sovereignty over the clay. God is not disturbed or panicked by detours that we have to take. In fact, he often uses them very specifically for his own purposes. We don't see what he sees from generation to generation. And this is most clearly 
expressed, his love and his permanent and eternal commitment is expressed in the person of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. His love is permanent. His love is enduring. His commitment is total and completely without reservation. This is the love that he extends to us. It's spoken of in the Old Testament in a cryptic kind of fashion here in Isaiah 49, 16. Behold, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. These are the marks of Christ's eternal, committed, undying, unreserved love towards you. His love is unfathomable. It is immeasurable. But he wants you to know it. He wants you to know it to the extent that you as a human being are able to do. So let me just ask you a few questions in closing, and I'm going to invite you forward for prayer. And when we come forward to pray, John, I would ask if you would play gently on the piano when we do that. Are you stuck? Are you stuck somewhere? There's a great promise here that meant a great deal to me one time, actually many times. To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power that is work within us, I think one version says exceedingly abundantly above. All we ask or all we think. What God provides to us is more than we understand ourselves. God has an eternal plan, an eternal purpose, which will unfold both in time and eternity. I, uh, I have these degrees on my wall. Some of you have seen that. I'm, it's a lot of work, a lot of effort. I want you to know something. There was a time when I didn't even think I was going to get out of college. I had a great time my first two half years. I mean, it was, it, was, it was fun, but it was really stupid. And I made a big mess of things. And after about two and a half years, I became a Christian, and, and, and I woke up, and I said, you know what? Time's moving on, and I'm not making much progress here. Things are kind of tangled up. And I went in to see a man named Dean Gordon Stewart. He was my dean. And my idea of authority was, well, the purpose of the person in authority is they are there to catch you. They're not there to help you. They're there to catch you. I said, well, I'm going to bite the bullet and go in and talk to Dean Stewart and tell him, you know what, things are a mess. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this alive. I just don't know how I'm going to work out these details. There's a lot of loose ends here that don't plug in. Before I went in, to speak with him, I, I was a believer. I had a little uh, Gideon's Bible. And I opened up, it was a King James, and I read this verse. It says, now to him who will do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. I just knew God was speaking to me. And God was saying, Steve, you're not going to graduate. You're not just going to graduate. You're going to do way more than you think you're going to do. Little did I even imagine that I'd actually become a dean of a seminary one day. I just wanted to graduate. <laughs> and I went in, and Dean Stewart became a very close friend. He said, you know what? I mean, it just surprised me. I thought, I caught you. You messed up here. You messed up here. You're never going to get out of this. That's what I was expecting to hear. He says, I want to do everything I can to help you. He says, we're going to work this out, and, and, and you're, going to, you're, you're going to graduate, and you're going to, and you're going to do well. And every, it, he became like a friend. Every time I would go and visit him, he would want to know what happened. And even after I graduated, I'd go back, and he would take me into the um, faculty dining room. And we would have lunch together. It was like God supernaturally gave favor and opened this door. And there was a couple of times 
when uh, some of the other teachers didn't want me to take certain classes, and I just said, well, Dean Stewart said I could do it. <laughs> and they said, oh, he did? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he said I could do it. <laughs> and that was it. God gives favor. God opens doors. You feel stuck somewhere? Hey, I don't see a way. I, may, I have made a mess. I don't deserve this. You really don't. That's true. But that's not the point, is it? It's not the point. The point is, he will do for you exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think according to the power that's in work in you. Are you struggling for the next step? Who do you look to? Your connections, that's, that's fine. Your resources, that's fine. You better have the connection and you better have the resource because that's where it all comes from. Are you attempted to avoid your hard place? because You don't see how it can work out. I could have just said, you know what? This is no use. I'm not going into this meeting. This is going to be painful. May you be able to comprehend with all the saints God's fathomless, extravagant love and provision towards you in Jesus Christ. Worship of the flawless Father opens Christ's unsearchable riches to us. I think we need to open ourselves to Christ's unsearchable riches. I need, think we need to come and seek the Lord for his presence in our lives. For his provision, for his help. Especially where we might be stuck. Stuck. 